I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. My name's Tim and I'll be the one speaking, but let's first go through the order of what we normally do here at the college. The first thing is uh, one fool at a time, and the second is no personal attacks, so though I have a feeling I'm going to be open season tonight. <laughs> I want to just briefly explain the format to people who haven't been here before. There'll be a brief announcements period, followed by my bloviations on why I believe Wall Street and the big banks are absolutely essential. Then there'll be an extensive Q&A period, and remember, it is a question, and I'm sure I'll be much maligned at that point. After that, there'll be a much-anticipated rebuttal period, which I hope will be a lively and feisty debate tonight. Without further ado, we will hear from our speaker tonight, <coughs> Tim Bolger. Yay! Yeah, Tim Bolger. Yeah, Tim Bolger. Yeah, Tim Bolger. Yeah, Tim no relation to Ray Bolger, right? I believe four or five generations uh. back. <laughs> <laughs> There once was this little boy who, after watching TV one night, asked his father, What is politics? And the father said, Well, let me explain it this way. I go to work every day and bring home the money. So I am what you call a capitalist. Now your mother takes the money, pays the bills, and makes sure everyone, everything runs well. So she is called the government. And because we take care of you, you would be the people. Now your nanny is the working class, and your little baby brother would be what we all consider the future. The little boy said, okay, and went off to play. Later that night, he was awakened by the baby crying. He got up and went to his, the baby, into the baby's room, and wow, did it stink. Very bad diaper. So he went into his parents' room, but his mom was sleeping and his dad was missing. So he went looking for his dad, and he heard sounds from his nanny's room. He tried the door, it was locked, and he looked through the keyhole and saw his dad and an Andy going at it together in the bed. So the little boy decided to go back to sleep. The next morning when he saw his dad, he said, Dad, I know what politics really means now. His dad very proudly said, Well, great. Tell me in your own words. Well, the little boy said, Politics is when the capitalists screw the working class while the government sleeps, the people are ignored, and the future is in deep shit. Courtesy of the capitalists <laughs> Well put. On that note, I'm going to tell you why our big banks, Wall Street, and the infrastructure of capitalism is absolutely essential to the running of our country. I'm hoping in this brief speech to give you what is probably the most well-known but most well-ignored part of capitalism, and that's the infrastructure of property rights and why it is so essential to our missing system. And the main reason why we're prosperous in the United States is because of a well-functioning court and property rights system, and five-sixths of the world don't have it. And because of that well-structured property rights system, and the way that it works, is probably the best way we can see prosperity. And we've seen it already. Once these systems are in place, countries start c coming around. I'm going to first show a quick video clip from the gentleman who wrote a book called The Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto. It was written in early 2003, and his own words, well, his own words are probably the best that will describe it. I'll put it on now. Did the bus boy bring your salad? Yes, sir. Did he bring your salad? No. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. Capitalism is failing. For most of the world, its immediate or most recent enemy, not its only enemy, but its most recent enemy called communism, collapsed. And all the world said, good, we accept the capitalist system, and it isn't working in the majority of the world. started massively moving towards cities and towns. 
all throughout the third world. When they were out in the countryside, they could only really do one thing, which is be farmers. <coughs> now, all of a sudden, the possibility of diversifying and actually having a gratifying life has increased. We all talk about a global economy and a global world. And yet, we know very little about how two-thirds of the world lives and what it's up to. And it is important that we get acquainted with them because they are the majority of the world's population. There is really no difference between the rich and the poor. They all want the same things. The first thing these people want are homes. Or they want constructions in which they can be sheltered when they do business. They want infrastructure. They want schools. They want shops. Uh, they want exactly the same things. Migrated. This is where they want to be. This is where they realize subconsciously that the division of labor is going to work in their favor. And either we give them a stake in the game, or they're going to bring down the existing game as many times as necessary until they're able to participate in it. Wherever you go in the developing world, you will see lots of children. In the 18th and 19th century, the Industrial Revolution began in Europe. And lots of little kids like this, the Oliver Twists of the Europeans, came into the cities with the purpose of joining the broader, wealthier economy. And just like Oliver Twists, they've come here to be part of the capitalist game. And they're watching TV, and they're looking at newspapers, they're looking just over the hill. And now they know how you live in the West. And they, and they all that. have smartphones now. What a market economy is about, what a capitalist system is about, is people that cluster together spontaneously to try and divide labor among themselves in such a way as to be more productive. They get together like they're doing here. First of all, very precarious, huts, as you can see, uh, built sometimes with debris, with garbage that eventually one day will become houses, like houses anywhere else. But that's the way capitalism begins. Obviously, if poor people and the excluded have migrated towards the cities and the towns, it's because they want to be included in the system. But they haven't been able to be included, among other things, because they found a large paper wall that obstructs their entry. In other words, the legal systems are simply unfriendly to poor people. Legal complications are what history is made of. Simplification is relatively recent. Two-thirds of the world's population, four billion people, are locked out of the capitalist system. They want to participate, but they can't, because participating means being able to make safe contracts with everybody, being able to get credit, having an identity that will be recognized on a broad scale throughout the world, and having the possibility to organize production so that they can enter foreign markets. They can't. So what they've done is created their own legal system, what we call the extra-legal system. That's why we don't term it illegal. AKA the Extra-legal does not mean lawlessness. It means that they're outside the formal written legal system, <coughs> but that they have their own rules, very specific ones, on how to hold on to property, how to differentiate between owners, how to make contracts, how to enforce contracts, how to give credit, how to respect families, how to create families. Extra legal simply means that outside the formal legal system, a new system is being created made of customs and procedures that people consider legitimate and efficient. Here, what you can see behind me in those buildings, in the high rises, in the glass structures, are what is the minority in any developing or former Soviet Union country. We're the westernized people. We live very much like most of the citizens in the North Atlantic, in the developed countries of Asia. But in fact, we are a minority. We are really the marginals of the country. We are not the mainstream. 
The fact is that the majority of the people work and live outside the legal system. These people are the engine of growth. Without hardly any assistance from the outside world, they are changing slums into cities. It's these people that produce the wealth. These people have assets. The total value of their homes in Peru is about $80 billion. They've got shops and they have an identity. There is no way an entrepreneur can really create huge amounts of wealth unless he's got all these tools of the law that we take for granted. And we even forget that most of us didn't have access to them until the 1850s when in New York, Dudley Smith was the first to make reforms in the world so that you could create a company in the U.S. without an act of Congress. So we've got to understand that either we quickly make capitalism friendly to the majority, or that majority will find an alternative ideology, as it always does. It could be called communism, it could be called fascism, it could be called al qaedism it could be called castrism. It'll find an alternative, because people are governed by ideas. Don't be fooled. Poverty doesn't incite people to terrorism. People get angry and violent, and terrorism grows when people feel excluded. The first way to beat terrorism is make everybody feel that they're part of the society. Bring them in, and we will have less problems with terrorism. Are there any films where the rich people live? You know, Charlie, you may be wanting to do your class warfare deal, but the point of the matter is, is that you know about 80% of the world's population doesn't have access to credit banks, assets, reliable property documents, and the whole gambit that will allow them to prosper. You know, and Hernando de Soto basically, I think, outlines the case pretty well of why we not need less capitalism, but much more. Much more capitalism, where we include the poor in the legal system, where we include the resident countries of the dictatorship in there. In his book, The Mystery of Capital, Hernando de Soto also describes what it takes to own a house in Egypt. With us, we go buy something, yeah, we get a mortgage, we have a day of closure documents. Basically, in one or two days, if we decide to buy a house and we have the money, it can be ours. In Egypt, the process can take up to 17 years through all the various bureaucratic barriers. To try to get a registered business in some of these countries, it's also quite the onerous process. It's not that I'm saying that government regulation is oppressive, but I'm saying it is absolutely very, very necessary. And that government regulation and legal system has to be made available to all people. In our country, you know, we buy a car. How many of you recently bought a car or have bought a car in your life? What do, you, what do you have that proves ownership of that car? A title, a title right? Okay. Well, the, the lender has my title. Well, the lender has your title. They own a car, but you're paying on it. Yes. You, have whatever you, want. you know, I'm and, that, ownership. and that is something that a lot of the poor people in other undeveloped countries don't <coughs> have. They don't have that identity in here. For example, Coming you know, I pull out something see. like this. Basically, it's a debit this card. Is your water. And the debit card is not me, but it's a representation of who I am. I can use it to pay for the meal here, to go online and make various transactions. And in general, it's going to represent exactly who I am, my current balance in my bank account, and then I can go out, buy things with it, do things with it. I also have something else here, which is another major miracle, an actual credit card, Whoa. which basically does the same thing, but then they're trusting me to make payments on this thing. And generally, the credit report goes into it. And those are all major inventions in the Western world that are highly regulated, that are highly useful to commerce. And who regulates that commerce and who does it? It's something called a bank. A bank is where you put money into the bank. You have a checking account. You have a savings account. You have a commercial account. You may have a brokerage account. But these guys provide the essential financial services that all of us need. How many of you don't have a checking account? 
Never been to my life. Okay, but how do you pay for bills? Money orders and cash, right? right. And and you usually go to a currency exchange, and when you use a money order, you usually you have a form of you have a stable address, correct? Absolutely. Okay, there you go. Your identity, but and then you also have a payment history and a credit report as well, because they do take your payment history. And with a lot of this online stuff going on today, your identity, your things, it's all absolutely essential to a modern economy. Now, again, as Hernando de Soto explained, many poor in the world don't have access to these very basic tools of prosperity. And this is where your government comes in and your banks. Now, one of the most striking examples of where land reform happened was right after World War II in Japan. MacArthur came in and he basically had the property of the peasants and, and the people registered into a big centralized database of, of government documents. They were able to get their ownership of their property where they had, that they had been inherited in generations before. And usually these documents coincided with a neighborhood registry or something that said this guy owns this piece of property and he's here, he wants to go into the city and buy a house or buy something else. And he was able to do that. Before, it was all controlled by the feudal lords of Japan. After the uh, reforms that were enacted under the Marshall Plan and under various other regulations that MacArthur put in Japan, they then prospered. The same thing with Taiwan. You know, the, the infrastructure got in place, people were able to own property, get a mortgage, go to a bank, uh, prove that they, who they were, they were able to start businesses. And basically they were able to get by in life because they had the tools and the and access to the rule of law. Now, what most people forget when they say deregulate, deregulate, I don't think they're referring to the basic regulation that will allow people to get money, access to money and credit. I think what they were referring to is when government gets a little too deep into the business world. I'm going to give you a brief example now of you know, why we do it. Now, there's a new book coming out, and it's it's uh, basically been written. Uh, hang on here. I'll, I'm going to pull up another video. I think this guy will explain. Okay, anyway. The gentleman's name is Richard S. X. Bove, and he's going to be coming out with a book in December. It's called Guardians of Prosperity, Why Americans Need the Big Banks. He's going to try to broaden the discussion concerning the financial system of the United States. Americans have been taught by their political meters and the media that the bankers caused the financial crisis that began in 2008, and they did so due to their personal greed of the American people. I don't think that that was the pro pro problem with the financial crisis. In order for capitalism to really work well, you have to trust the documents that you put on or infer with. For example, I pull out my credit card. They know it's me. I make a purchase. And it represents me, and, and I can do things on it. But if you have identity fraud, where somebody steals your identity, that's a crime. And what it simply means is that they can take over your life, they can open up things in your name, and you can no longer trust the credit card that that person does. So you go in and you get some new numbers in order to get a new credit card or a new <coughs> verification of your identity. I un the reason why we had the financial crisis, I believe, was there was one lie on top of another lie on top of another lie. Let me give you an example. Say you go to Pete here, and Pete wants to buy a home. Pete doesn't make that much money, but he says, okay, I'll uh, I'll, I'll take that $100,000 loan, but and I make $150,000 in income. Well, we can't verify it, but eh, maybe we'll just do the no doc, no, no loan thing. The banker gets that, and that's lie number one. The banker gets the documents, he said, huh, but you know, I got all this money here, and 
I'm just going to sell it off anyway, and I'll grant him the loan. So the mortgage company grants the loan, the money's transferred over, then they sell it off under a security to somebody else, and they put it together with other loans and bundle them together. And of course, that now goes to the rating agency. Rating agency is all, the credit's A1, it's all good. Line number three, you compound those lies, and you compound the way we've been doing things like that over time, of course you're going to have a bubble because people are going to lose trust in the assets that they have bought or hold. And when you lie about things like that, that's where the system breaks down. For example, the classic bubble where stocks are overvalued. Well, in a sense, it is just they're, they're trying to make as much money as possible. People are, oh, I think it's going to be okay. But it, too, is somewhat of a lie. Capitalism works best when you have true valuation of assets. You have true valuation of the loans. You have a little bit of regulation to keep out fraud. And yes, you need small banks. You need big banks. Now, let's move on to our corporations. The corporation and the revenue bond I consider is probably one of the best inventions that were ever made. Granted, it was under the uh, things like the credit mobilier and other items where there was a lot of fraud involved, but the genuine invention of the corporation, as Hernando de Soto pointed out, you can create a company without consent of the queen. You just go in, fill out some papers, get a few people together, get that company together, get a large amount of capital together issue stock, take out a mortgage on that company, employ people to do various things. And any small business today, all it takes is about, Paul, how much the incorporation rate for the state of Illinois right now? I believe I paid about $250. $250 and he starts a business. <clears throat> and he, on that business, he can open up a checking account. He can then hire people. He can then get his sales through. And then he draws a salary off of it. Mm -hmm. Chris, Chris, you incorporated when you bought this restaurant, correct? Right. Right. And, and, and you have a corporation or a, a fundamental structure under it, correct? And you, and you do it to protect your valuation of your assets and your homes, right? There you have. Now, is Chris a big, modern, evil corporation? No. He opened it up to serve people in a restaurant, and he eventually wants this restaurant to be profitable, make him some money, and make a living at it. And that is an admirable thing to do. But as they were saying, if you were in another country and you were poor and you wanted to open a restaurant, you couldn't get access to those legal tools or framework. That's why you need to get this capitalist system as we have it in the States with the minimal amount of regulation and with the poor having access to the legal system. My God, you'll see prosperity grow all over the place. That's why we need the banks. Now, let's take a look at Wall Street. <clears throat> I'm going to play another video here real quick, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm just living for the Times TV and today. I'm joined by Dick Bove, who's an analyst at Rafferty Capital. Now, Dick, it's so great having you here with us today. Now, we are here to talk about your book, Why America Needs Big Banks. Why is it that we do for our audience that's watching? I, th I think the key reason is because we operate in a huge world financial, global financial system. And in that global financial system, American banks are competing heavily with banks from places as diverse as Canada and China. And the net effect is they're growing while we're shrinking. And that's going to put us in a pretty, pretty bad position. And something that you were talking about in the book, you were saying that banking regulators failed the American people, that the American people are the ones that suffered from the bailout, not the banks. So what exactly do you think are the regulations that need to be put in place? You're not a fan of Glass-Steagall or the Volcker Rule as well. What do you think needs to be put in place? People who do their jobs. All right. In other words, there were regulations there that were strong enough to prevent a lot of the uh, excesses that occurred in the financial cycle, but the regulators simply did not do what they were supposed to do. The people at the Federal Reserve completely abandoned their responsibilities. The FDIC did not do what it was supposed to do. 
the OCC did not do what it was supposed to do. So if we're going to have regulations, you need regulators who are going to follow the regulations. We didn't have them. Does that also go along with the credit rating agencies? So how, how do we count on them when they failed us in the 2008 financial crisis? Yeah, no, I don't think you can. I think that everybody who decides to buy securities should evaluate those securities on their own using their own disciplines. And if they choose not to do that and they want to use third parties, then they're at risk. Now, when we look at Alan Greenspan and Volcker, when they were in their credit crises, they didn't have QE like Bernanke has right now. How do you think government regulating requirements have basically nullified QE right now? Well, ba basically what's happened is that the Federal Reserve prints all this money under QE 1, 2, and 3, uh, and it doesn't seem to realize that by s establishing <coughs> rules for banks, like the liquidity requirements, like the Basel III, like the supplementary leverage requirements, like the orderly liquidation authority, that they're taking money out of the uh, banking system as rapidly as they're putting it in, thereby they're doing something on the right hand which they're completely nullifying with what they do on the left. Now, since we do have financials coming up, earnings, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, we're seeing profit margins at an all-time high, but it's not necessarily reflected in revenue. What are you looking forward to when you get these earnings coming out? I think the fourth quarter earnings are not going to be particularly exciting for any, for any bank and company. I think that, you know, they've gone as far as they can go almost in reducing their loan loss reserves. They'll do a little bit more of that. But they're not getting the revenues that they need to really push the earnings. I do think, however, in 2014, those revenues will be there because I think the economy will do quite good. But I don't think that the fourth quarter will be exciting. And finally, if there is another crisis that we do go through, is it because some might argue that we kicked the can down the road by bailing out the banks in 2008? Or do you think it's because of the regulations that you were talking about? I think that, that the regulators have created a staggering amount of risk in the financial system by shifting uh, business away from the regulated banks to the unregulated portion of the financial industry, and therefore we definitely will have another financial crisis, and it will be worse than this one. Well, Dick, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Who's that guy? He was the one who wrote, he was coming out with a book called Guardians of Prosperity, Why America Needs Big Banks to Try to Broaden the Discussion and Direction of the Financial System in the United States. Um, he actually was a financial, he is a financial analyst on Wall Street. We can get more into this in the Q&A period. Basically, I'm going to try to end this speech fairly quickly because I know we're going to have a lot of questions tonight on this stuff. The banks, for me, are absolutely an essential product that will provide services and goods and the flow and transfer of money around the world. We also need Wall Street to be able to issue securities. What we don't need is a lot of fraud and a lot of other malcontents trying to muck up the system. There is a real balance here. I don't think people are mad so much at capitalism itself, but about the chance of not being able to participate or to get ahead. What I've outlined tonight is maybe just a little bit of a better way of how we can get ahead in the game, how we in the United States have a lot more advantages than other people do on this score, but that we need to take this capitalist revolution worldwide. The history of capitalism in the West is a story of how governments adopted the people's law and the uniform rules and codes that could understand, that all could understand and respect. Ownership, once represented by dogs, fences, and armed guards, is now represented by records, titles, and shares. The moment Westerners were able to focus on the title of a house and not just the house itself, they achieved a huge advantage over the rest of humanity. With titles, shares, and property laws, people could suddenly go beyond looking at these assets as they are, houses used for shelter, to thinking what they could be Sorry, what they could be used for, security for credit or the start to expand the business. Through widespread integrated property systems, Western nations inadvertently created a staircase that allowed their citizens to climb out of the grubby basement of the material world into the realm where capital is created. The poor are not the problem we think they are. 
but the solution to their own plight. The time is right to take the definition of property away from conservative legal establishments, which sees the law as an unmovable edifice and put it in the hands of politicians who realize the law as a social consensus. Once these property rights are recognized, capitalism can flourish. Now to further kind of stir the pot, I'm going to show the clip of uh, our good old ladies capitalist, Gordon Gecko. Oh, uh, Just damn. to get our things <laughs> flowing. Green is good. Is this green is good? Green is I, think, I think it is. Green but it is, is in a sense enlightened self-interest. Remember, a difference between enlightened self-interest and greed. The education is not good. As much as I can get away. Yeah. Three weeks is not good. I appreciate the opportunity yeah, you're giving me, Mr. Right. Cromwell, as a single larger shareholder to tell our paper to speak. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're not here to indulge in fantasy, but in political and economic reality. America, America has become a second-rate power. Its trade deficit and its fiscal deficit are at nightmare proportions. Now, in the days of the free market, when our country was a top industrial power, there was accountability in the stock market. The Carnegie's, the Mellon's, the men that built this great industrial empire made sure of it because it was their money at stake. Today, management has no stake in the company. All together, these men sitting up here own less than 3% of the company. And where does Mr. Cromwell put his million dollars? Not to tell our stock, he owns less than 1%. Come on, guys. You own the company. That's right. You, the stockholder, and you are all being royally screwed over by these, these bureaucrats with their, their state lunches, their hunting and fishing trips, their, their corporate jets and golden parachutes. This is an outrage! Tell our paper, Mr. Cromwell, tell our paper has 33 different vice presidents each earning over $200,000 a year. Now, I have spent the last two months analyzing what all these guys do, and I still can't figure it out. One thing I do know is that our paper company lost $110 million last year, and I'll bet that half of that we spent in all the paperwork going back and forth and we don't leave vice president. The new law of evolution in corporate America seems to be survival of the unfit. Well, in my book, you either do it right or you get eliminated. Nothing? In the last seven deals that I've been involved with, there were 2.5 million stockholders who have made a pre-tax profit of $12 billion. Take one for ten. Yeah, give me a couple minutes. I am not a destroyer of companies. I am a liberator of them. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of an evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge, has marked an upward surge of mankind, and greed, to mark my words, will not only stay tell our paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. He makes a good point, doesn't he? I mean, it may not be that you agree that greed is good, but I would tend to consider it more enlightened self-interest, maybe a little bit of doing things right and morality. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more, some other things coming on board. Rodner's a protege of <laughs> One fool at a time. Well, maybe Rauner could learn a few things from this gentleman. I 
will now take your questions. I can turn this off. All right, we'll start with Neil Rest. Uh, I, I don't know where to start. Uh, oh, well, in that case, somebody who does. If, 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 well, incidentally, if greed is good, what about lust and sloth and vanity and, and uh, I mean, they're right there with avarice. Aren't, aren't they good, too? Yes, that makes sense. Let's just put it this way, Neil. Look at Las Vegas that operates a highly competitive business that provides jobs based on the seven deadly Based sins. on drugging people. <laughs> well, okay, it is my self-interest. I know. It is, it is my self-interest to steal as much as I can get away with. The record is very clear that if I steal enough, I can get away with anything. So enlighten me. Why shouldn't I? Because what you're saying, I agree with you, is absolutely wrong. <laughs> That's why we have laws. That's why we have fraud. That's why we have they a get law stolen enforcement. Too. What you have to differentiate yourself from is the system of capitalism and the human behavior that will perpetrate fraud. Right. right. We're in Plato's cave. We're not out in the sunshine. If you're out in the sunshine, a free market naturally develops, not a uh, socialistic or, or system. Now, people want to be treated fairly. I, a free market will develop naturally. You go, you go to any village, over time, there'll be a marketplace. There'll be some money that it changes hands. There may be a government or some form of government that will have records of ownership of the, the people and places around, or it may be a mosque, or it may be some kind of association. But there will be a medium of exchange, there will be a marketplace, and that basically is capitalism. Yeah, yes, Charlie. All right, Charlie, and then... Uh, yeah, Tim, I noticed in your video on an unregulated economy that those workers in that petroleum place weren't wearing respirators. In an unregulated economy, I guess employee <coughs> occupational safety and health is, doesn't exist. No, Charlie, I never it's said that. It's in my own movie. It's in my own movie, and that's a third world country that's developing. And I think that it's absolutely essential to have laws for employee health and safety. But the point of the matter is, is that they may not have been regulated at the time, but I do believe that as the country prospers and grows, those laws will be put into place. They'll be dead by then. Yeah, I know. So you're saying that the petroleum that he's providing, because they don't have masks on, the company should be shut down? Oh, it should be by yeah. America. Oh, yeah. You want, what they're, do we, have, you want them to die? By you know, guys? well, Charlie, <laughs> what's the word? All that will happen then is that somebody will get gas cans and fulfill the need for gasoline somewhere else through another way. Now, what we would like to see would be a properly ran company with proper laws. And the way you do that is by making the law accessible to the people through the proper application of letting them get their capital, letting them get in there. And there's something called a licensing procedure that goes into place when these countries start moving forward. I am not going to sit here and comment and say, yes, there might be some health and safety occupation problems. But you also have to remember, we're applying our United States Western standards of occupational health and safety to some of these third world countries. Now, I agree with you. I wish standards were all around uniform. And I don't know why, you know, they're, they're doing what they're doing in that film. But if you're just going to focus that this company doesn't have health and safety proper equipment and shut it down, somebody else who may be even worse may come along. That's you say. No, it's not the system I'd like. What I'd like to see is businesses be able to form, partnerships be able to come up, access to capital 
or the poor and the downtrodden that they could take those shops and their assets and build a better company. If that company is not true to its word, doesn't keep its customers happy, maybe cheats on somebody else, another one will come along and replace it. Mike, uh, Mike did you have a question? If not, I'll move over to Gene Harker. Okay, Gene. Uh, there, how, uh, Tim, how does uh, things like, uh, like North Dakota has a, a state bank and there are credit unions Mm -hmm. I think there used to be also you could uh, deposit money in the in the post office. I don't know if that's around anymore. But how do those fit into your system? Well, they are absolutely essential. Some some other governments do it different ways. I know in uh, certain African countries the post office does function as a bank. I think uh, Britain has it that way, and I think Europe also has a lot of banks that they can go in, but they also have private banks. They also have other credit unions that go in. What you're describing is just one form of availability of credit, and we have it in the United States. The state bank is, is backed by the assets of the state, and they can provide probably those loans and those discounted things to things, discounted rates to other people. But again, they're providing the service. They're not the only game in town, though. They do have private banks. Yeah. Okay, would you like a question? Yes. Uh, uh, no. Dave Travis? Ah, yes. uh, thank you. <clears throat> I've heard it said that the fear of the Lord uh, is the beginning of wisdom, but the beginning sorry. of wisdom is a definition of terms. So in the interest of having a definition of terms here, when you say that greed is good, which I yeah. agree with, okay. that... Uh, uh, for example, you're certainly not talking about somebody saying, gee, I'm greedy, they have more money, so I'm going to go rob a bank or hold up a gas station. Uh, when you say greed is good, I think what is meant by that is, for instance, if uh, Mr. Stein has a, a company that manufactures gloves and uh, he makes for himself $100,000 a year and he employs 40 people, and he says, I'm, I've got enough, but I'm greedy for more, so I'm going to buy the property next door, build a new building, and, uh, and set up a new, buy machinery and everything, and set up enough of a company to make women's gloves. Yep. And I'm going to make 200,000 a year, yep. and I'm going to employ 80 people every year. Mm -hmm. I mean, 80 people in the thing, and so, Therefore, I'll make 200000 a year for myself, and then later down the road, I may just build another wing on the company and start making work gloves. Well, so this is greed in its ideal form. Yes. And this is what is good, and I think that's what you mean that's, when you say greed is good. That's exactly what I'm talking about, enlightened self-interest. Um, there is a type of, you know, and I, I bring the Gordon Gecko speech out a little bit because he does have some neat things to say. I mean, you know, America, you know, in our own sense, we're shooting ourselves in the foot because we used to make things 40, 50 years ago. And one of the things that has kind of infected is a lot of this Keynesian economics where we're actually selling off our assets as seed corn. Our intellectual property is being sold off to the highest bidder. Our companies are being sold off to the highest bidder. And we're not the true capitalist country we used to be. And that's probably one of the reasons why we're not as, as, uh, we're not as prosperous as we'd like to be. Because we're selling more of our seed corn assets rather than making things. You know, even with the financial bubble we had, if you look at the real estate market, a house is a place to live, but it's also somewhat of a consumable good. You know, you buy it, you live in it, you use it, you renovate it, and, you know, the value may go up over time, but it's not what we call an asset like a company or a manufacturing plant or something along those lines would be. We... If I was to do any kind of reform 
in the United States, I would say, hey, let's get back to making things. Let's get back to manufacturing. Let's get back to doing and building rather than buying and selling paper assets all over the place. Now, Wall Street provides an essential role for that to happen. And we've seen it time and time again in one of the most unregulated industries around the world. And that being the uh, information technology industry, particularly. How many of you have noticed something in the last 26 years called the Internet? Okay. Yeah. You it's know, out there. Yeah. It's out there. Most of that was built by private funding. Wow. Uh, most of it, you know, there were governments. There was a, uh, a research done on the Internet. Uh, there was a university network in there, and yes, Al Gore did help co-sponsor the bill to make it uh, privately owned, but once the telecom companies had a chance to get at it, they basically wired the world through fiber. Now, we had the bankruptcy of Global Crossing, we've had several bankruptcies and booms and busts, but the world generally is a better place because that capitalism was allowed to flourish and prosper. There are a set of agreed upon standards called HTTP. And you can go into what they call the RFCs, or the Request for Comments, in Google. I'll, I can show you that at some other point. But there is a small governing structure over the internet that say this is how you do things, this is how things go. And it's mostly been through a collaborative effort. Now, as it gets more, in, in, as, as it gets more in, intrusive, and influence, you know, you're seeing now large companies starting to get a little out of line, you know, like in Europe with Google and the privacy laws. But, you know, as, as with anything else, it's, it's just going to be a process of making sure that it works in our lives and doesn't become intrusive. Okay, uh, did I answer your yes, question? Uh, Doug was here. Oh. Yes, Doug. Uh, oh, okay, I got a several lengthy ones, so just bear with me. That's fine. Because I warm through it. Huh. Okay, Tim. <laughs> All right. Do you <laughs> do you agree that capitalism came to a grinding halt? I'm saying around 2008. I don't know if that's the right exact date, because the big banks at Wall Street had overhedged the mortgage markets through the overinvestment in derivatives and the layoffs and terminations of thousands of workers across the country who were paying on those mortgages caused the bubble to burst. I think, Doug, you just described exactly what happened in the financial crisis. Again, I said earlier that I don't think capitalism throws up, but the credit markets throws up. How many of you guys have ever heard of a blog on NPR called NPR Money? Uh, there, There is a really good program that uh, does it called This American Life, and they kind of have an archive of uh, programs and, and, and money, and they explain very thoroughly how the banks work, how the big banks collapsed, how the credit market froze up, how the commercial paper market froze up, how uh, trust was lost in, in the confidence of investors, and, you know, what you had there was not so much a, but you know, people did still go to the markets. People still did go buy things. There was jobs lost. You know, you realize something here, that one dollar out of every $26 in America is spent at a convenience store, like a 7-Eleven or a gas station or something else, every day. And, we, and that was still going on. We didn't lose capitalism. We lost trust in the credit markets. Yeah. And that's why there was a large amount of layoffs. A lot, of, a lot of lying on the valuation of credit assets. Yeah, but the, the bankers came hand in hand yes. to the government pleading, help us, save us from ourselves. The thing is, is that I honestly think that if we had let the Wall Street firms fail, we would have been in much deeper trouble than we were now. Now, I've been, I have looked at some of the agreements that went between these big banks and the TARP funds. And this was no free lunch to the banks. The government actually loaned these guys these money and had it at such onerous terms on the banks that the banks wanted to get out of it as quickly as possible. 
And in most cases, the banks have repaid those TARP funds, and the government has actually made money on it. They didn't bail them out. What I call the government did was they were the venture capitalists of last resort. Did I answer your question? More or less. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Ernie. Ernie? Yeah. Uh, I want to get your take on TARP, the TARP program. Uh, I asked this question of, of some other people, and maybe I'll tell you later. But uh, if TARP had not passed, uh, what would have happened? Would we have seen uh, massive unemployment, bankruptcies? Uh, would the lights have gone out? Uh, and what would some of the uh, alternatives have been, such as uh, governments taking over the banks for a period of time? Look at 1933, 1929 to 1933, and what the Federal Reserve did or did not do to avert a Great Depression. They didn't bail out the banks. They didn't do anything. They let the assets fail. And we had a much worse, much more prolonged depression than I think we would have done. You have to remember that the, I think it was uh, Tim Geithner, who was the head of the Federal Reserve at the time, his main impetus was the Great Depression and how it could be absolved. You have to remember that the FDIC and a lot of the banking regulations came out of the Great Depression because of what government didn't do. Now, I honestly think that a lot of people say, oh, let the banks fail and go bankrupt. Yes, there's something to be said about that. But when the system is so pervasive and so, and you know, people would have not lost just their assets, but had you had the classic run on the bank, had you had the classic things, we would have probably seen revolution in the streets. Now, I'm not saying that TARP is the most ideal way to bail out the banks and, hey, where's my bailout too, you know? But honestly, I think we averted a major disaster by government intervention. And remember, I consider that bill was not a giveaway. They were given funds to you know, shore up their balance sheet. And it was done on rather onerous terms. For example, our automobile industry. We had a, a very lackadaisical automobile industry for many, many years. You know, they produced big cars and big SUVs. But when the government came in, when they came hat in hand to the government, they were required. We want you to change your board of directors. We want you to make cars that people can buy. We have environmental requirements that we want you to do. And again, they were the investors of last resort. Most of these automobile companies wanted to get out from under the companies in there. And we also do, it's not unprecedented, Lee Iacocca did it with Chrysler in the 80s and he said the one thing I did not want to do was I wanted to pay those government loans off fast and get the government off my back. But in a sense, if we didn't intervene or act, we would have had an even greater recession, probably cognizant to the 1930s. And, but what, what, is the, what would have been the problem of actually having, uh, as was done in Europe in some places, having the government take control, get the, get the system back to normal, and then uh, reprivatize the banks? That's one way of doing it you know, like Europe did. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do remember, in the Roosevelt administration, they had the bank holiday. Yes. Uh, here in the United States, uh, I think there would have been widespread uh, problems with government control. But, you know, if you look right now, if a bank goes belly up, who's the first people in there? It's the FDIC. And they, they take over the bank. They either sell its assets off, and you're insured on your deposits up to a certain amount. And, you know, it works. I mean, I, I know that the banking system in Europe may be a little different than ours, but in a sense, it works the way they want to work it. You know, it's not like you have to have everything the way the U.S. does, because with a market system, with, with different ways, people do things many different ways to achieve the same goal, and generally what wins out 
is the one that's the most efficient and the most best way to do things. Let me, let me make just a little Okay. Comment. The person that I asked that question of uh, was Henry Paulson. Uh -huh. He talked for about four minutes on it, and, and you did a much better job. I don't think, I don't agree. Right. Uh, I, I think TARPA was not a good idea, but uh, your answer was better than his. Okay. So maybe I should become Federal Reserve Chairman. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think I saw the man in the white hat and dark glasses there. Uh, a Lone Ranger. Uh, uh, Tim. Uh, some of us can go back a few, few years. You little younger, you can go back. I can go back at least 60. Good. Now, we know, we heard about the uh, first, uh, uh, back in the 20s, uh, we had this crisis. We also read, and we know about what the government, how the government responded to this crisis in the 20s and 33 and so forth and so on. Right. Now, this government passed laws so this wouldn't happen again. Now, in the uh, future, uh, uh, subsequently, these banks in the late 90s, in the 20s, doing the same thing that they were doing, worse thing that they were doing back then. Now, we supposed to be moving towards the thought of you. We supposed to be moving forward and way ahead economically, financially, if no other reason we got the, uh, uh, what do you call that? We got the internet. And they can take the internet, stick up their ass for a lump or something. Now, how are you going to sit there with confidence and convince me and whoever else listening that all we got to do is wait and the government in the future going to make it even where all of us can get in? Well, they ain't did that before. They let these people, uh, uh, you heard of the Sherman Antitrust Act? Yes. Yeah, well, how can you sit there and say the market is taking place when uh, all kinds of violations of the Sherman Antitrust Act? I'm saying that's not the marketplace, that's cloud in connection. Yes. You see, Jane brings up a really good point, too, because I'm saying that the infrastructure of capitalism works and works very well. But again, when you have fraud in place, there is a need for unions, there is a need for the antitrust regulations, and there is a need sometimes when you have a couple of big dominant market players that come in. Now, in the early teens in this country, we had trusts. We had much worse than we have now. And, and Gina, I have to commend you because that's what worked to bring, finally bring prosperity to the country is when they finally made wage in late when labor and management finally made wage peace in the early 20s and the workers got a little more money than what they were doing before as a result of the change of culture from management and labor instead of the adversarial things they were doing in the earlier part of the century that's when the country prospered and you also must remember, too, right after World War II, one of the reasons why we prospered so well was we were the only game in town. We were the only country that was unaffected by, you know, the devastating war of World War II, and that prosperity lasted 30 years. We also had a very highly committed executive team who were very moral and upgraded. And, you know, when you looked in 1949 at Harvard Business School, they were wanting to create good companies, not maximize profits and not uh, give it all to me and, and be good for themselves. See, a good owner of a company, as he said, provides jobs, but he's also very fair. And I, I, work, I myself work for a small family business, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but, uh, you know, generally, you know, if, if something really happens, I can go to my boss and he'll, you know, help out a little bit on something or another. And there will be some help given. Maybe it might cost me a little more than I'd like to have once in a while, going to form a commitment or something else. And he may have you a little bit more. But generally, I like where I work. 
Um, I think most of the time it's been fair and, and, and whatever. And if people are treated fairly in, 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 in an employment situation, you're not going to have much trouble. The reason unions exist is when management is trying to take advantage of workers' pay and benefits. They have to organize to fight uh, some really greedy people at the top who should know better. Uh, all the time, though. Not all the time. I mean, you've got to understand. Name a time it wasn't. Uh, yeah. I'm going to tell the company owner, you should know better. So, Jim, <laughs> got to follow up to that. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> directly with you. you all right. Now, uh, Dean Archer mentioned something earlier right. about uh, regular yeah. unions, small state banks, and so forth right. and so on. Now, you, which one, uh, to me, uh, say the size don't make too much of a difference in right. the budget uh, situation. Now, to, 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 my question to you is, does the bank has to uh -huh. be grandy? And I mean, uh, the capital has got to be trillions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars to do the job? Or could it be a, a, a state bank doing all they can correctly? They wouldn't, they wouldn't be uh, uh, adequate to, to, in your system? I think there's a room for both. Oh, okay. You need a place like uh, Shearson Lehman Brothers or some of the other major Wall Street firms to take a billion dollar corporation and say go public. You have a small state bank that could take a, a restaurant like this and maybe give it a loan to improve its kitchen equipment. There's a place for all sizes of banks. What I'm saying is that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, let's get into human conduct a little bit. You know, everybody here thinks that the rich 1% is uh, out to get you. I know a lot of people who are rich cheapskates, but I also know people who, too, who have made money and have been very beneficial with the use of that wealth. You don't have oh, huh? <laughs> yes, I do. I actually know a couple of really rich people who are very philanthropic, who live way below their means, and are very, very good about how they make money and how they use their money and how they put it into foundations and other things. I'm not going to tell you who they are now, but offline I will. I don't really think I have a question. Go ahead. Because it seems that for years, decades, centuries, we've had <coughs> depressions, recessions, uh, periods of, of years when uh, people were not working. And businesses and banks. Mm -hmm. We're going under. Uh, isn't there a lot of inefficiency uh, in this? And might uh, some uh, alternate uh, mechanisms uh, of economy, uh, might not they uh, remedy uh, this sort of thing? Uh, would you call it capitalism then? Or would it matter what, what you called it, as long as it worked well for most people most of the time? You, you know, Brom, you bring up a point of where we have depressions, recessions, recovery, and other things in there. And usually that can be best explained by, you know, People may overbuild and overindulge, and then they go bankrupt, and another company comes up and moves places. It's part of the natural process of things. Now, we live in a mixed economy. We, well, yeah, and the thing is, what I have to figure out is that in the United States, one of the reasons we are a prosperous nation is the ability to go bankrupt quickly. Liquidate your assets, uh, move on, and basically take care of it. Look, look at what happened with the city of Detroit recently. 18 months ago, they were in dire financial need. 
a bank ordered bankruptcy, saved their art collection, renegotiated their bills and pensions, wiped off a lot of the debt. A lot of people took a lot of pain to have some of that debt wiped off, <coughs> but they're now going to be able to reemerge out of bankruptcy, a much more healthy financial entity or financial form of government. Now, uh, Karl Marx said that he found that the, uh, it wasn't just him, it was Ricardo and, uh, and even uh, Adam Smith found that there was a tendency overall mm -hmm. for the rate of profit to fall and that created uh, greater and greater tensions between the owning class, the capitalist class, <coughs> and the working class uh, dependent uh, on employment by the capitalist owners. Uh, you said this was such a tendency, so endemic uh, that uh, eventually, uh, the uh, capitalist class would be replaced by a new owning class, uh, which might be democratic, uh, might be uh, the working class. Uh, is that possible, and would it be beneficial? The reason I don't think that's possible is because of the very way human nature is. Um, you're going to have greedy crazies at the top. You're going to have people who misuse and funds. You're going to have people who commit fraud. But I'm going to tell you something right now. Especially in the online world where I work through eBay and Amazon and all this stuff like this, if you, if you say I'm going to sell this class on eBay, and if I don't describe this class properly, it's just going to be returned, or somebody's going to file some kind of suit against me. And you better be darn sure that that thing better be described accurately, and that the price paid is a price agreed to. You know, you have, um, for example, if I was to sell this class on eBay, the guy buys it, I'm going to ship it UPS, I better provide a tracking number, it's got to arrive on time within a reasonable amount of trouble. And uh, if he, you know, if all of a sudden he says, oh, this glass wasn't blue like it was on the listing, but you know it's a clear glass, he bought a clear glass, and he's trying to defraud you, you're going to have a way of making it. You see, in a sense, the online world of, of eBay represents, can represent a, a government entity or a regulatory class. They have a bank, which is PayPal. They have a certain amount of regulations which you have to abide by the list and, and an agreement that you follow and then you're free to buy and sell as you choose. Recently, there has been a lot of changes in eBay that have made it a little more onerous to do business with them because they've been trying a little more often to, you know, tell you how to do your returns policy. You know, a returns policy for a consumer electronics manufacturing refurbished company is not going to be the same as a high-end jeweler, for example. Um, why, Charlie? That makes no, absolutely no sense. If I send money to you and I don't get what I wanted, what should it matter if it's a, a diamond or... A That's diamond? just the basic part of doing business. It makes no sense. What it does make true? sense is that a, a, a piece of jewelry is much more easily shipped, it's much more easily valued, and... If the woman doesn't like it, it's much more easily returnable. If you're buying a television set, for example, online, it's a little more difficult to list because you got the features, you got the benefits, you got all this stuff. Second of all, you got to make sure that TV ships properly. And what happens when it gets to the customer and it's all of a sudden damaged? You're, you got to take responsibility for putting in a claim to UPS. You got to refund the customer's money after your claim is paid by UPS. Huh? And that's exactly what you do. You're about them. No, I'm not complaining about it, but when, you know, say for example a customer buys something and then they don't like it want to return it, I believe they should have to pay for the cost of return shipping for that item. It's called, it's called a, a, a thing. And then there's a lot of times too if the item doesn't come back, it's called a buyer's remorse policy, which I think in certain instances is very well done. 
and very well taken care of. All right. Now, the same people are asking questions. Okay. So, yeah, a lot of other people are not. Yeah. Uh, come on, move on. Uh, David <laughs> Travis. It's taken forever. Uh, yes, uh, uh, one pool at a time, please. Uh, yes, and when you talked about the automobile industry, and you said they had to go to the government hat in hand, and that the government was a, uh, a venture capitalist of last resort and so forth, the, the fact is that uh, American Motors couldn't compete, and they got bought by Chrysler. Later, Chrysler was already on the skids before we got into the uh, subprime meltdown situation, and they were sold off to Mercedes-Benz, a uh, Daimler-Benz, and right. then they quickly saw the mistake <coughs> they made, and they took a bath for umpteen billion, and they got rid of it. Chrysler, <coughs> along with General Motors, went to the U.S. government to, to borrow money. Right. But today, Chrysler is owned by Fiat. And General Motors should have been allowed to fail. Because in a true free market capitalist system, boom and bust are right. a natural part of the order. And people who work and save their money judiciously, when a bust comes, they have an opportunity to step in and buy and become an owner of a business right. where the other owner didn't handle it right. That's so correct. So General Motors should have been allowed to go bust, and, and so should AIG and most of those other ones and let the chips fall where they where they may. In in the meantime, Ford Motor Company who handled things question. properly. Uh, yeah. one fool at a time, please. How about a question? Uh, how After about ten minutes. let me finish my question. Okay. Okay. Sure. Ford Motors never Do had so. to go to to ask for <laughs> Will you shut up? No, Ford okay. Motors <laughs> never had to go to <laughs> To the government, they they handled their things. So my question is, isn't it better to just let them fold? Messy. And the thing I'm going to say is this, okay? Sometimes the government made a decision that we wanted a viable automotive industry. Had we let them fail, I think the job loss, the resulting problems that would have been a result of that would have been far more catastrophic than what I... See, I'm not against government intervention in some parts of the economy. What I am saying is that basically the tools of capitalism work. They're viable, they need to be implemented a lot more, and sometimes if an industry is big like that and there's a lot of jobs on the line, uh, I don't think the role of government would preclude it from preventing a bankruptcy as long as a company is restructured, comes out of bankruptcy, and is able to do it. Now, like even like even with the car, uh, uh, philosophically, I don't like it when the government brings in a bank or, or takes over something either. I'd much rather see the bankruptcy process go through in an orderly fashion. But sometimes. <clears throat> In an extreme circumstance, like what we had in 2008, the results of letting those companies go bankrupt would have been far more devastating than the brief period of government intervention. Yes, all right, Mike Lee. Thank you. Uh, two, two part question. First of all, who was that financial Wall Street dude? I mean, uh, what did he what did he say? Because it was awfully loud and his voice was very muffled. Um, what did he, wait, wait, wait. What did he say and why did you like what he said? And you had it here. And my second part question is, mm -hmm. um, in effect, since we've been giving the banks, well, we've been buying bonds and giving them $80 billion a month for many, many months, many years, in effect, are the banks now nationalized, really? No. The banks are not actualized. The gentleman you're doing it is he wrote, wrote a book called The Guardians of Prosperity. 
Why America Needs Big Banks. His name is Richard X. Bove, B-O-V-E, and the reason he wrote the book was the fact that it is now an established part of the United States consciousness that the banks did it and need to be punished has resulted in a series of new laws and regulations. The question in the book is says, who has been most impacted by the new regime? It's not the banks, it's U.S. households. It's people running from place to place that are more impacted by the new banking regulations than the banks are. Uh, the book is good. I have a flyer here if you'd like to find out much more about the author and what he has to say. Basically what he's simply saying is that big banks need to be big in order to provide big companies, big loans, big financial products and services with the backing of billions of dollars in order to keep these corporations that are big like like a Facebook IPO for example or like providing a credit card or a commercial paper backing for some new plant or equipment or some other thing. And if they're not going to get it here and we want to make our banks smaller, they're just going to go overseas and find another bank that will finance them. <coughs> Right, uh, Paul Orsino. Hi, as you know, I'm a small person in a big world trying to run a small business because I can't find some big company that wants to hire me. With, with the bust in 2008, one of the other times I got in trouble and failed because of things other people did, um, my thought was, why give all this money to the banks because people's mortgages, people were being foreclosed on and mortgages, so you're ending up with a bunch of people with no place to live. Then the banks end up with all their money and their houses. It, it, why not pay off these mortgages and then people have homes they can live in? You know, that probably wouldn't have been a bad idea instead of giving it to the banks. Uh, I, as I said before, I don't like the way TARP did it, but it was the one way that the government stopped an even more catastrophic crisis from coming. Paul, you know, I am not against what you say, because there is something in the Bible called the Year of Jubilee, and, you know, every seven years, debts are wiped away, I believe. Well, if they paid off the mortgages, the bank would still get their money, and these people would have a house to live in. That's true. And they'd have money to spend at small businesses like mine. Go ahead. Jubilee is every 50 years or 49. Oh, okay. Every 50 years instead of every 49? Well, I think it's 49. Okay. Yeah, he's right. Oh, yeah. so, so, That's correct. I stand correct. Okay. Uh, a week of weeks, right. Okay. Um, you said that, if I understood you correct, you were basically saying that the banks were punished because they have to deal with these new regulations. Now, isn't it true that the banks engaged in massive corruption um, and um, toward the people from right. the, the mortgage fraud, and massive fraud. And yes. uh, nobody, people didn't go to jail, nobody went to jail, and the banks weren't nationalized. Um, they're still too big to fail. Um, and I mean, and, 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 and I've even heard that these regulations aren't strong enough, so uh, do you really think they were punished? I don't think they were punished. Or they certainly weren't punished enough, uh, very, very little compared to the massive fraud and corruption. And, and the, the, we still got the problem of being too big to fail. Or was it just the market? You know, what? you bring up, I don't really have an answer for your question. I do know that there is such a thing as a lawsuit. There is such a thing as a Justice Department. And that if they had been enforced a little more appropriately, we probably would not have seen the massive fraud. But remember, it was just not the big banks. It was the people who wrote the mortgages, some of the people who put it in with the applications. It was a series of lies, not just. We just can't blame just the banks because a lot of it is. Real estate bubble. Frankly, frankly, I want to say a lot of it's ourselves. 
Uh, we all wanted something for nothing. Are you accusing us of greed? Oh, yes. <laughs> but greed is good in a sense that if you earn the money, you keep it. How about Goldman Sachs, who was... Who was uh, um, telling people to buy, telling the public to buy certain products. They should have been indicted it. for securities fraud and pursued with the lawsuit from the government. Yeah. And if the government didn't pursue it, then that's our fault for electing the officials in charge in the first place. Our officials would have a fat crack. Right. Carl? Yes, go ahead. Well, uh, speaking of uh, greed, uh, do uh, payday loan stores uh, fit into your economy plan? Yes, they do. Uh, yeah, he, they do in his case. In my case, they do. I've had to take out several loans at a payday wow. loan store. Now, here's the thing. I was able to get out of a temporary financial hole with them, knowing full well that I'm going to be paying through the nose for this money. Currently, I can tell you of one person over here at a certain check-and-go store that I happen to have a very, let's say, lucrative relationship with. About once a year or something like that, a big unanticipated expense comes my way. I may use them to get a short-term loan. But if I'm going to use it for a long-term loan, I'm going to get that loan paid off and refinance through some form of a, either a refinance in the car title loan or on some other asset that I may own. But yes, they do play a very important role in uh, providing a temporary help for financial things. And here's the deal. They're regulated. They post their interest rates firmly at the door. Uh, and you can generally get the credit a lot easier than you could by going to a local bank. That's the market they fill. They're profitable institutions. I don't think they should be done away with. Wow. Uh, Carl? That was my question. I asked. That's your question. Okay. All right. Did, I, did I answer it for you? Else? Thank you. Yeah. I know where you stand. Okay. Okay, Tim, in the system you support, I guess the guy, let's go to the guy with the three glove factories. Right. That produces $1 million, let's say, profit a year. Right. Now, I've heard this said, well, he built the factories, but he actually doesn't build the factories because <laughs> he doesn't put down any bricks or found any nails in the roof or anything, so he didn't really build the factories. As a matter of fact, he's never worked a day, possibly, in any of the three factories. And if there are any loans, they were paid for by the people who actually worked there. Is this a system you... So, he actually has done absolutely no work whatsoever, and he gets three million dollars a year. Is this a system? Well, let's say 120 people I heard do all the work. Well, most of the work in production. What about the work in sales? What so about he the work? He doesn't do anything. He's got 40 workers in each factory. And he's probably got a sales department. He probably has a marketing department. He probably doesn't change the question. Yeah, I know. He's got 40 people. He okay, he's got 120 employees. Now, right. Yeah. So and you're the resentful that the guy was successful enough to build a business to where he can retire and do nothing? No, we're I think he did nothing. Not one minute of work. Not one minute of actual work. All right, we'll just say to him, because he was able to build that business, able to make it prosper, able to hire those people. Well, Charlie, anybody in that position who owns a business like that has usually worked to build that business. He doesn't have to now, but he probably did in the past, and he's probably reaping the benefits. What you're giving me is a hypothetical. What you're giving me, Charlie, is the sponge at the top not doing a damn thing. The sponge at the top is probably the son or daughter of the owner who's probably going to a private school 
who probably doesn't really know how to work. Well, the, That's the sponge. Well, what happens to the sons and daughters of the people who built the factory and work in it? The 120 people. What happens to their children? It's called business succession. In each case, it's a little bit different. This is a system you support? Yes, I support it because the individuals have their own choice to make in how they run their businesses and affairs. If the owner is stupid enough to turn over his multi-million dollar business to some no ne'er-do-all children who will run into the bankruptcy, then to heck with him. Now the workers, if they're proper and there's a proper succession plan in place, he'll probably incorporate, he'll probably turn it into some corporation, and he'll probably have professional management run it. Point of order, yes. how do we move uh -huh. on to rebuttals? Okay, I think it's now... Rebuttal time. No. Yes, it's 8 o'clock. It's now time for rebuttals. All right, we want to thank you. Yes. I'm expecting to be fully... There's never been a fair. Well, you're going to be fired up. I'm fully expecting to be roasted alive, so let's the roastings begin. All right. Uh, that's what we've heard it for Tim. Uh, I want to know how many people here have remarks to make on the capitalist system or uh, alternatives thereto or anything else. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Maybe even me. Yeah, all right. Uh, five minutes. Maybe please. twelve. Five minutes each. Four minutes. Right. You gotta have time for the last word. Uh, yes. And uh, Tim gets the last word. So. You uh, don't know. Four minutes each. Uh, that's your limit. Uh, then you're trespassing on somebody else's for five minutes. <laughs> Five minutes. You know that? Okay, starting with Gene Harker. And a boy, Gene. You think they visit these factories and put a phone to sleep? Uh. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, in spite of the fact that I usually don't agree with you, uh, it's always fun to listen to you and hear what you have to say. Uh, one of the nice things about being here at the College of Complexes is you hear about other systems. A couple weeks ago we heard about distributism. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, 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 talked about Dorothy Day and the Catholic uh, worker system. That system is actually uh, operating in Chicago. Uh, it's on a very, it seems to be on a very small scale. There's a lady from my church who's not a Catholic, believe me, uh, is uh, in one of these Catholic worker groups. So you can look this system up on the internet. I just put the word distributism into the internet and then printed that out. Now I got to read it, understand it uh, better. Uh, also, uh, I think last in our last uh, in our last uh, I think it was last week we heard of Mondragon Mond Mondragon. Uh, corporation. Mondragon. Mondragon. I'm sorry. I've got it here and I can't can't even read it. But anyway, that is also covered in uh, Richard Wolff's book, uh, Democracy at Work. So he talks about that. And that that system in uh, in Spain is apparently working very well. On the other hand, it's pretty small. Uh, also, distributism is also, as far as I can tell, uh, very small. So uh, whether these are, in fact, viable systems that could uh, compete with uh, capitalism, I don't know. But uh, Richard Wolff also was on a Moyer about August of uh, 
last year. And so you can get a chance to get that uh, DVD, take a look at that. Uh, again, I read his book. I felt it was a little boring, to be honest with you. But he says that there is something called workers' self-directed enterprises. Workers' self-directed enterprises. This is a form of socialism uh, that where all of the workers in a corporation uh, are the management of the corporation. So that's uh, as opposed to, say, communism that we've heard of where it's actually uh, a form of uh, state capitalism. So uh, if you want, both of these can be found on the internet. All you got to do is uh, put in the name of the corporation or distributism and you'll, uh, you can print out a whole, you know, 10 or 15 pages that will explain the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Well, I appreciate it. When I hear... Oh, thank you, my dears. Microphone? Microphone. If the gentleman is taking a position that therefore our capitalism is good and the alternative to that is to look at advantages and disadvantages that there are obvious um, problems with capitalism, uh, such as the uh, business uh, cycle, and uh, <clears throat> those things, um, <clears throat> can they be remedied uh, legally or otherwise uh, so as uh, to do the least harm? <clears throat> the gentleman uh, looks at ideal capitalism, that's fine. But what you have in this country is not the ideal. You have a group of one, the one percenters that are doing everything uh, legally or illegally to foster their ideology. The big problem that we have with capitalism is that it's run by a bunch of uh, crazy nuts. <clears throat> they get, um, absolutely, they get uh, re-elected. Uh, <clears throat> the newspapers are afraid to uh, tell the truth or they'll cut off the funding. This was true ever since uh, Nixon. And on that basis, uh, all, every uh, newspaper in Illinois was for Romner. And there's no reason for that, yes, except you had the economic coercion. Yes, the problem Thank is you, not with capitalism, the ideal that the gentleman is speaking about, but it's a per perversion of the right-wing um, <clears throat> ideology by this group of nuts. And uh, <clears throat> you, get, you don't get uh, things like the minimum wage, the things that would correct things, uh, you get um, propaganda by the lobbyists and uh, <clears throat> they're buying Congress uh, <clears throat> and that is a great problem. It's not what this guy is uh, <clears throat> talking about the primitive capitalism as being good and functional. It is. But the perversion that you have uh, is uh, <clears throat> so uh, noxious and dangerous to our society. For example, for the last uh, six years at least, we should have been repairing our um, <coughs> infrastructure. Uh, and uh, we should have been employing the, um, <coughs> the unemployed to do that. It's the obvious thing in the world. But uh, you have a bunch of nuts in Congress that are against uh, spending anything. You wouldn't have the um, <coughs> uh, interstate uh, highway system or the internet if the government had to spend money. Right. And uh, <clears throat> the problem that we're fighting is not uh, those that critically look at some of the defects that I've mentioned in capitalism, but this bunch of nuts that are, are, are uh, that are ruling everything, that's our enemy. Thank you. Yeah, very The problem that we have, uh, I, I'm afraid I want to disagree with, uh, with Jim Bolger. I, I mean, I'm a capitalist also. I support capitalism. But the problem that we have 
is a much more fundamental underlying problem that was never touched on, and that is, uh, as Ann Rand pointed out in her book, Capitalism, the Unknown Idea, <coughs> is that uh, a sound currency is at the very foundation <coughs> of capitalism. And in um, uh, uh, the early days of our republic, our founders in that, they had actually set it up that a $1 gold piece would, it was uh, established that there would be so many grains of gold per each dollar in a gold coin, and so many grains of so silver in each silver piece. But somehow we got away from that. So that we have this inflationary thing where each nation is screwing the other nation. So that Europe, uh, America gets the jump on Europe. Europe later gets the jump on America, uh, Switzerland, and each one. And uh, it goes back and forth. And then they say, well, it's a better money supply for Europe so that we can sell our products because American dollars are cheaper. And then, you know, we'll try to get it so that American dollars are more expensive when we go to collect the money for it. The fact is that every dollar should have a specified weight of gold that is redeemable by that dollar. And I will refer you to Ludwig von Mises. Thank you. The good faith and trust of the United States government. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for your hospitality. You know, uh, as always, I'm unprepared, but I've been thinking about this subject, and I apologize to our good friend, the speaker tonight. How much? Five minutes. Okay, I'll make it four and a half. Okay. We'll accept that. What I was thinking, I think, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night I, with a economic crisis in Greece, I, I got over eight, nine hundred pages notes. I could uh, write a book on that. But the biggest thing is, like some communist, maybe Lenin said, you know, theories and all that is okay, but life's experience. And me, experience taught me that capitalism, you know, versus communism, these are two extremes. The, the best I'll start with communism. The worst communism for the 99% is better than the best capitalism. Capitalism at its best for the 99% is not as good as communism is for the 99%. Uh, at its worst. Even through all the trials and tribulations of 27 million deaths inflicted by the Nazis, the economic blackmail and sanctions and everything, and they survived because they had one man at the helm. You know, they had Stalin and all the other people like Aganovich. They didn't have Harvard or MIT graduates. They had Lazar Kaganovich, a remarkable man with two years of education in elementary so school. Old. And he was one of the greatest leaders of the greatest society that ever existed on earth. <coughs> 70 years. And a lot of people say, hey, communism's dead, forget about it. I say, what do you mean communism's dead, forget about it? I talk to uh, millions of Christians. There's over one, two billion Christians in the world. They're waiting for the second coming. I said, what the hell? Look how patient the Christians are. If they can wait for the second coming, the communists can wait five, six hundred years for communism to come back. 
And if it doesn't come back in five, six hundred years, you can wait about five hundred years more. Because, you know, like Marx said, it's inevitable. <laughs> but, ah, yes. So the thing is that, cap, you know, you talk capitalism, capitalism, too. You, you know, like a military industrial complex. It isn't complex. I got a new word for it. I've said it before here. It's a military industrial cartel. You put a little mafia and uh, criminal association there. That's what it is. Complex. What's a complex? Who the hell knows what a complex is? But a military industrial mafia cartel. Well, hey, you know what it is. So. In my life of 60 plus Chicago, I ran into rich people, poor people, sane people, insane people, all kinds. And uh, one thing I found is that if you talk to workers, you deal with workers. Now, as a lawyer for 44 years, I've dealt with a lot of working people and a lot of businessmen. Very seldom will you find a dishonest worker. The guy that works for a living at the factory or some uh, restaurants or some the, the worker is mostly honest. There's also honest lawyers, honest carpenters, and good people everywhere that work for a living. Even policemen? <laughs> <laughs> so, There's some honest policemen too. Yeah, Damn it, one at all. <laughs> I've been shaken down when my brother Back in, when we were around 22 years old, had an accident in Belmont and Central. And they wanted to shake me down for $200 so they wouldn't take my brother to Cook County Jail where he would be gang raped. So I saw Chicago's finest at their best when they put me in that squad car in the back of the Northwest Hotel, which was at Austin and uh, uh, Addison. Then. Time. Time's up. So, in other words, you sure don't have five seconds? No. no. Okay. That's it. Uh, I think I said more than enough. Okay. Well, uh, I think I'm going to start my rebola with a question. Why do we good citizens of this country have to always pay for the greed of others. And I'm going to take you back uh, to the 1980s briefly uh, because uh, that was the first exposure I had to the, the problems of greed. And if you remember the savings and loan debacle of the 80s and how did it all come about? Well, you remember savings and loans were guaranteed by the people of the United States of America. But our president at that time, Ronald Reagan, in his wisdom, I guess the trickle-down economics and wanting to help the people out, he went and looked at the savings and loan auditors that were out there, and he said, this is too much. They're holding back business. These people could do better without all these regulations. So he did better than, uh, you know, that happened in the in the 2008 where we're saying the auditors looked the other way or were asleep at the switch, he got rid of all of them. And you know what happened then? They had a field day with the savings and loans. Everything, they were giving loans out to anybody and everybody again. <coughs> and, uh, and then the, the Spella, the FDIC chairman at that time, Sudman, he, he had all these assets, so he had to get rid of them. To, to prop up uh, what the government was obligated to pay the investors. And then when he came up short, guess who paid the bill? All of us. I think we paid 16 or 18,000 per person uh, to get out of that debacle. And uh, so, you know, we're always, the government has to step in and save, you know, these companies. We had this term used too big to fail. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, you really have to scratch your head over, and using one of uh, Bob uh, Lichtenberg's intangibles, ethics, 
uh, why, why are the rich and the powerful always breaking the rules of ethics? You know, we have rules and regulations. I should say the principles of ethics. We have to have rules and regulations in place because people do not do things ethically. And, and, and that is one of the biggest problems uh, of human existence. Every time somebody does something, it seems like the rest of us have to pay the price. Somebody drives 50 miles over the speed limit, and all of a sudden we have to have cameras put up so the rest of us don't drive 50 miles over the hour, over the speed limit and cause a terrible accident or kill people. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it reminds me when you were in grammar school where one person would do something and the whole class had to pay the price because somebody screwed up. And uh, until people, you know, us accountants, I'm an accountant, Ernie over here is an accountant, auditor, uh, tax preparer, we always start talking about ethics in our fields. And, you know, you never really hear anything about ethical behavior among bank people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the television, uh, I mean, uh, slides on the wall there that the man put up there, and the guy was talking about the poor people here and the poor people there, how they done moved into that and so forth and so on. <laughs> that reminds me of the 60s. <laughs> when the black civil rights movement was at its peak, and they were going out south riding the buses, integrate the buses, going in the restaurants and so forth. Now, some of the uh, uh, white landowners and, and business owners would come on television and they would accuse Martin Luther King or Dick Gregory or somebody else as outside agitators. So these are outside agitators. These people here, they've been here for years, their grandmother, blah, 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 say, say hey, boy, come here. And, and tell, uh, or sound bad on television. Uh, I say, Bill, come over here and tell tell the uh, public here that how we treat you down here. And Bill got up to the television. He said, "Am I on television?" He said, "Yeah, go ahead, boy. Tell him." Uh, oh, he said, "Help!" So I guess <laughs> that's what a lot of poor people all over the world is saying. Help! Is somebody out there pushing it? fantasy and making up stuff as they go along. Oh, look how so many people here. Look how well you're doing and blah, blah, blah. Folks hungry in Chicago, hungry in Mexico, hungry wherever they are. Wow. So so uh, 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 they have to get that down for, for as I'm concerned. Now, as far as uh, the, the rich people, and in, in he mentioned that Bill, I mean, uh, Bojo mentioned that, that they, they give back and so forth and so on. Now that's almost like when J.P. Uh, uh, Chase, uh, uh, Bank of America, they done did all kinds of uh, uh, bad stuff and, and collected hundreds of millions of dollars a year that they don't supposed to have. So since you can't put the corporation in jail, you go over and tell them, say, listen, you're going to have to give me uh, 14 million. Now, give me a break, please. If I done made of $115 billion, you mean I can't get nobody? That's like advertising. That's like paying advertising. That's no punishment at all. You know. So, so that that's what they that's what they use again. Now, as it, it, far as the uh, uh, other thing, they say if the, if you don't take the uh, uh, save these banks, this gonna happen and that's gonna happen. Well, if you remember, remember like I remember, when you gave the banks the money, believe it or not, a, ba a bank like Bank of America go and buy. Uh, Wells Fargo, another bank bought uh, 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 Merrill Lynch, and, and, the, and, the, and the CEOs that was working on Wall Street at, at, at Golden Sachs, they got 160 million. This guy got 200 million after the government gave him all these billions of dollars. Well, I got news for you. You can take care of everybody, hard worker in the in the uh, country for that kind of money. My name is uh, Dennis Nelson. Thanks, Tim, for your presentation. The only way uh, that the banks, Wall Street, and corporations 
will only be the best things which will bring America back is for the people who are doing all the bad things to start acting responsibly. The best way for me to respond uh, to you, Tim, is to talk about my own political perspective that's socially evolved and developed, you could say it over like 44 years now. I'm a progressive and a populist. I accept the Jeffersonian democratic principles that our nation was founded on. When the voting age was lowered to 18 in 1972, I voted for George McGovern. And being the democratic, progressive, and populist presidential candidate, McGovern lost in a landslide to Richard Nixon. But he, he was later vindicated and proven correct about the corruptness of the Nixon Agnew administration. The Watergate scandal was just the tip of the entire iceberg. I'm going to borrow liberally, if I can use that word liberally, from Jim Hightower's excellent column about my daddy's populism uh, in the most recent issue of The Progressive. Jim Hightower tells us what real populism is. Quote, for some 238 years, it has been the chief impulse in America's body politic, determinedly democratic, vigilantly resistant to oppressive power of corporations and Wall Street, committed to grassroots percolate up economics, unquote. Jim Hightower sees what I call a silver lining within the dark cloud of an unresponsive system of representative government. We have a, quote, ripening opportunity for a revitalized 21st century populist movement. Every day there are populist uprisings, both large and small, all across the country, unquote. Towns taking on big oil and gas fracking. I'm going to be speaking next week about solving our climate problem. Crisis. Please ask me about oil and gas fracking next Saturday because it's not going to be included in my formal climate presentation. We also have cities uh, raising the minimum wage, fast food workers demanding a living wage, and states taking on mandatory labeling for genetically modified organisms, GMOs, in our food. These are all issues that are very dear and close to my heart, Tim. As a progressive and a populist, I've worked on them all. Tim, uh, you're going to need the progressive and populists like myself yes. to kick those irresponsible banks, Wall Street firms, and corporations in their proverbial butts. Anybody who thinks that they're going to act responsibly without populist grassroots pressure and governmental watchdogs without teeth is living in the, and just living in their own dream world. Next, I have some material that I adapted liberally, and again, that use that term again, liberally, from the suburb. 2013 book, Wall Street Values, <laughs> Business Ethics and the Global Financial Crisis by Michael Santoro and Ronald Strauss. I've used this in my many action alerts pushing for financial reform. What they basically say is that, I don't know if I'll be able to get through all this, is that more stringent regulation, like with the, uh, the 2010 Dodd-Frank Act, is not going to be enough that our economic prosperity will only be truly sustainable if the Wall Street professionals themselves begin an urgently needed conversation about restoring sound and robust business ethical principles and values to a central role in their endeavors, such as client conflicts of interest and compensation practices. Good business ethics and practices will improve a firm's financial performance. The effective management of organizational ethics and values remains indispensable for a truly sustainable economy. Quote, the financial market simply cannot work effectively and, and efficiently unless executives who manage financial institutions do so with appropriate values, good business ethics, and adroit management skills, unquote. Uh, thanks a lot, and see you here next week. Thank you, Dennis Nelson. The rest is next. Yeah. My fellow there. Uh, yes. Let's see if I can I can make my stopwatch gizmo actually work. Um, this this is this is an exceptionally target rich environment. Today in the United States, there are a hundred million people who want a full time job and can't get one. Between the middle of 2009 and the middle of 2011, during the so-called recovery, median household income went down faster than it did during the so-called recession. 
And this is a number which I had to research because I was so boggled. One hundred from from oh nine to eleven, the so-called recovery, one hundred and twenty-one percent of the increase in national household income went to the top one percent. So if the system of yours is that wonderful and naturally produces such wonderful results, you need a much more robust explanation for why it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a quick point in passing, the internet developed out of a collaboration between two communities. One is the Pentagon, and the other was electronics computer enthusiasts, uh, many of whom did start companies from time to time, but they were enthusiasts uh, first. Uh, it has later, once it was there, <clears throat> people are trying to figure out commercial applications, but, it, but it, 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 its origins are not, um, are not capitalist. Um, the first video uh, struck me personally especially hard. Uh, about ten years ago, I had the opportunity to spend two weeks touring Peru. So half of what you saw, I've been there, which is very emphatic. Incidentally, that shot in the, in the favelas, which are presumably Cusco, of the women carrying both the, the, the 20 kilo buckets of water and the baby, that's over two miles above sea level. Mm. It ain't easy. Yeah. Cusco was the capital of the Inca Empire. The Inca Empire, which ran for thousands of miles from Ecuador or even Colombia down through Peru and Bolivia and bits of Brazil and Argentina and Chile, thousands of miles long, millions of people, an integrated economy at a very high level, did not have the concept of money. There was no such thing as money in the Inca Empire. That's not how they organized things. So this business about money being some kind of natural inevitability uh, is make-believe. Yeah, people, are, people are, are walking to the cities everywhere in the world as fast as they can. We've just hit, a year or three ago, a profound historic moment. Over half of humanity lives in cities. This is unlike any, any time ever before. But part of the reason is they're being driven off the land by global capitalism. They're being starved off the land. And it's interesting that somehow um, these, these favelas in Cusco are naturally going to become very pretty neighborhoods full of nice bourgeois consumers. Um, it, it's not happening, and I'm not sure w what makes it natural that it's inevitable. Uh, we're getting those same people across our southern border. Two, three, four countries south of here the United States has helped screw up the local governments and armies so badly that women will risk their children's lives to ship them and never see them again to, in hopes that maybe they'll get into the United States where they can have a decent life. This is part of the picture that was left out of the picture. Um, as some of you may have heard, uh, immigration across our southern border is rather considered an issue by some people. Yes. Although the people who consider it an issue don't seem to notice that they are being taxed to finance the disruption which is making those people so desperate in the first place. Uh, that's uh, not quite five minutes. Thank you. Well, being one of the, by College of Complex's standards, right-wing radicals, uh, I will largely agree with the main tenets of Tim's talk. Uh, and that tenet is that a, that a properly functioning and appropriately regulated free market system will create most wealth overall. 
but now should we say properly functioning, I think we can look at America today and say that it is certainly not properly functioning when we have the huge inequities that we have, and we have the inequities that are getting worse, not better, as time goes on, particularly with regard to uh, what happened in 2008, when you have a big crash in the economy, wealth inevitably moves up, and that's what's happened. Uh, the average American's income has stayed either flat or gone down, actually, since 1973, and it's been even a little bit more uh, extreme uh, since 2008. Uh, I heard a statistic this morning that uh, the average American uh, Real income has gone up by 0.3%, okay? It's not 3%, 0.3% in, in the last year. So things are not going well. We, we do not have a, an appropriately functioning uh, free market system. And, uh, oh, or another, just, just a side note here, we keep talking about the, the 1%, the, the rich 1% that's running things. No, it's not the, the 1%. It's the 0.05% or even less people than that that are really running it. This 1% is a symbolic number. It's really a much smaller group of people than that that really uh, run things. Now, how do, we, uh, how do we take this free market system, which should be such a boon, and in, in throughout much of our history did create huge amounts of wealth? Uh, First of all, yes, we should have some better regulations. We should be punishing people who did the things that they did in 2008, and we didn't. Uh, as has been pointed out, uh, nobody or almost nobody went to jail. They should have. Uh, but I think one of the best ways, and I've said this before, you know, I'm a, I'm a taxation guy. Uh, the best way to, to handle a healthy free market is let the market uh, run itself pretty well with appropriate regulation and then combine that with a good tax system to do some leveling uh, of, the, of the fruits of the nation, shall we say. Uh, a system that would mitigate the inequality. Uh, this, is the big, this is the big problem with the market system. It tends toward, if left to its own devices, it will tend toward extreme inequality. Uh, as it has done even more so in some other countries, and is it, as it is doing here. But with a sensible taxation, eliminate the regressive taxes, increase uh, especially the payroll tax, that is the most regressive of taxes, because even if you're dirt poor and you work, you will pay the payroll tax. Um, and then increase the income taxes, uh, especially at the high end, at the upper middle and the upper end especially. Uh, a one-time net worth tax to uh, level things out a bit and to put revenue into the Treasury to rebuild our infrastructure, possibly even pay off some of the national debt. And uh, the other thing that I would do, and this is never popular even with a lot of liberals, uh, is eliminate uh, the wealth passing, most of the wealth passing from generation to generation. In other words, an inheritance tax, a uh, death tax, as the Republicans like the cost of uh, almost 100 percent. Because after all, in America, we, we talk about a level playing field giving everybody uh, a fair chance. All right, thank you very much. All right. All right. Okay, um, I, all right, I did not get to hear Tim's lecture tonight on, uh, on why the banks, Wall Street, and corporations will ultimately be the best thing that will bring back America. However, um, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, observe a privilege that has existed at the College of Complexes since time immemorial and comment on a lecture about which I know nothing. Now, first of all, um, first, you know, there was a, a famous man who said that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Actually, that was Lord Acton who said that. And uh, most, you know, 
Now, I've always been a believer in in um, in freedom and and democracy and human rights, and and I um, most people are concerned about the government getting too much power. The government gets too and, and I agree. When the government gets too much power, you know, it becomes tyranny. You know, it's not it's not a good government anymore. And then what you end up with is something like North Korea. But you can but you can also get too much power in in an institution like Wall Street where where you have people who basically have the legal right to rob you and get away with it and there's no legal recourse uh, so so that they become above the law so anytime uh, corporations too can become tyrannical when they uh, especially in the way they treat their employees well not only corporations but even small business owners can be t can be tyrants just not just not on as big of a scale so, so I, I believe that the tyranny of Wall Street would be just as bad as the tyranny of an authoritarian government. A tyr you know, tyranny is tyranny, and I'm against it no matter where, no matter who, no matter who is the dictator or the tyrant, no matter who the oppressive authority is. When you have a situation where, you know, where corporations can just, where employers and corporations can just do anything they want, and and um, and and you can't do anything. They can pollute it. They can pollute the air, poison the drinking water, treat uh, treat their employees like crap. Even um, um, and and basically basically um, drive their employees into an early grave. Um, and 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 then uh, you don't have a free society anymore. Who's got freedom? Only the rich have freedom. You know, the vast majority of people have no freedom at all. They got you got as much. Basically, you got as much freedom as you can buy. And uh, you know, I always like to say that nothing's free in a free market. Okay. <laughs> My name is Li Ping Yuan. Uh, thank you, Tim, for the, the, the presentation. I just learned the uh, so-called capitalism is uh, uh, have some ID for your property, like your car or your house or your business, and uh, that's uh, it's like stocks. Uh, so that's uh, pretty good for for the economy to boom to uh, so. It, Basically, for me, it's uh, like uh, technology. It's not really a, a, a policy. It's like a technology involvement. Uh, it's new technology evolved from old time. We have used coins to for trade, and then we have paper monies, and uh, then now nowadays we have those property titles and uh, stocks, and uh, then uh, uh, valuable uh, papers. Uh, they, they. I think they are innocent. They, they are not good or bad. It depend. All depend on how you use it. So, in the future, probably there will be more advancement, like a virtual dollars, like Bitcoin or something on the internet, or it's all, all virtual. Uh, probably will drive the economy even further because make everything transaction easier and uh, you can make uh, big trans transactions uh, without carrying uh, a load of paper to cash or something. So I think those are all good, but the problem is uh, uh, how the law will, will, will be written, who wrote them, and, uh, and how the law can evolve with all the technology to overcome some prob problems. Uh, like uh, when you have only coins, probably no big problems. Then you have paper cash. Then the government can print monies and uh, print lots of them. Then cause inflation and uh, that cause a, a major problem 
uh, many of no uh, use uh, have known through the history. And uh, then later we saw the all the paper, all the credit uh, credit cards and the paper uh, property like car titles and uh, all those uh, stocks and the, the, the credit world uh, really becomes important and uh, then we have a credit crisis like Tim said in 2008 it's it's basically a credit crisis a financial crisis there so uh, how the law can be written in a way that uh, to pre prevent those and uh, probably in the future we have big coins and uh, we have virtual uh, assets and how to handle those, uh, those are big, big problems uh, in the future. So I, I see these are all political problems, everything involved, how we organize, manage our society. Uh, a commercial here, I'll be uh, speaking in two weeks about uh, the future of democracy and uh, so I'll have some ideas and uh, present here, and uh, I also like to see uh, your uh, opinions, and uh, you may have some good ideas also. Okay, thank you. That's right. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention, um, right, get, though I'm not a capitalist, I'll give an advertisement. I forgot too that Dennis Nelson will be here next week with the reality of human caused climate disruption. The time to act is now. And then Lin Ping will be back. And we couldn't figure out a title, but he's going to cover, no doubt, uh, many topics. And also, that's going to be meeting 3,300, whatever that means, for the College of Complexes, which Whoa. I guess. Something of an accomplishment. I'll be eclectic as usual. Let's thank our speaker, Tim. <laughs> Get together a little time and effort into this. Um, let's see. Um, okay, I got rid of that. Uh, you ought to you ought to check your videos. At the end of the video, with the banker with the banker on it, he said he makes a prediction that that portion of the economy that's not regulated is likely to fail. And I couldn't understand why you... All right, whenever you guys want to... Eliana, we got a program in progress. Okay, um, but thinking of... I'm going to ask you again, we have a program in progress. If you don't mind, are you ready? We'll wait till you're done. <laughs> she does this all the time. Yeah, but I think you could talk over. No, no, we'll wait. We'll wait because you've got such important things to do. No, no, stop this. All right. Um, this thing about a little Tim, Tim Hedges this, and I heard it a couple times. He says, oh, it's okay, system. All it needs is a little regulation. And I was thinking, I went to the circus, and they have a guy in a cage with these man-eating tigers and lions, a lion tamer. And I guess he would say, well, these are, he's got a gun and a chair and a whip. He probably says, well, these are nice little, nice little kittens. They just need a little regulation. <laughs> uh, hey, and you, Ernie, I know you got a good point here, you know, about about getting the money back that is rightfully stolen from. Oh yeah, this thing about the factory, the glove factory. The first year, the guy, well, he doesn't build anything. He doesn't work in it, but he gets a million dollars for his glove factory number one. And then he gets another million for Globe Factory number two. And he takes the profits that the workers did for their work. And he makes the factory number three. And he gets three million. And then he gets four and five and six, you know. So that's the system I heard tonight. Uh, but regarding this inheritance tax, I, I don't know if we should wait till the guy who owns the Globe Factory dies. 
I mean, it's a little bit like saying a guy who robbed a bank and say we catch him, and he says, what? Well, you can give us the money back later. <laughs> or when you feel like it. And when you get around, to when you die, you can give us the money back. <laughs> no, um, no, I, a little drift. I'm not going to go too much in this, but during the week, I read this book, and it came out in 1950, about 25 years after the Russian Revolution, and it's a book about what the guy says is a typical city life in a city under socialism. And he says there's a, it's a city of about 130,000 people, and he says in the USSR there, there's about 183 cities like this in, in the country. And it, it has, he says it's along the river that it's situated, there's a line of industrial plants, it was largely a steel producing uh, city, there's a cement mill and towering blast furnaces, uh, ore concentration plants, uh, car building works, there's a coke chemical plant, and in the further in the distance he says a uh, fertilizer plant. And then he also says in this city as well there are producers cooperatives. There's a clothing factory, a milk processing facility, there's uh, two large mechanized bakeries, and he says 64 other different kinds of shops, uh, service shops. And the amazing thing is, he says in this city, he says you will not find a single person unemployed. Uh, there's a job for everyone. He says you will not find any man hiring others to make a profit for himself. Not one person is employed in the city to make money for some other guy. Uh, he said, nor, this is amazing, nor will you find a single banker, industrialist, or landlord in the entire city, throughout the entire city. I don't know, I think, I think that's a much better system. If, you, if we got to pick one out, I think I'll take that one. Anyhow, thanks a lot, Tim. Why He's you? telling me my time is up. What single banker? Get them out, run them out of town. Charlie, now. you can move to that mythical city if you would like. No, we, I want to stay I'd right here and make it this city. I like Chicago. this city. I well, like it this city. Capitalism at all. Yeah. Why don't we? Yeah, why don't the Greens uh, turn the city else. over to the polluters? Or, or we can get rid of the polluter. All right, just a couple uh, things. I think there's a problem with all this money now concentrated at the top. Uh, you know, this stimulus is part of it, and um, just giving this money to uh, Wall Street and the banks in New York to trickle down, um, you know, they're having a good old time trading that money back and forth and derivatives and stocks and bonds and so forth. It's eventually trickling down. I would rather see that three trillion dollars spread out in the economy, but of course the Tea Party wouldn't let that happen. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, Roosevelt did that. He had that New Deal and and um, his stimulus for uh, not New Deal but works programs. It went out into the economy and, and got people a lot of good jobs. So um, another thing about economics is the velocity of money. And when that money sits in Wall Street and the banks and sitting there and just getting traded and paper profits, there's something called velocity of money. The money has to move around throughout the economy and I think that's what's lacking here the last six years. Um, one thing about our new governor um, in what the past election, uh, it's, you know, this, this guy kind of represents, I think, a lot of the bad things about America. And, um, you know, offshoring and greed and Gordon Greg Gecko stuff. So, but I, I've heard big oil pretty much financed everything throughout the country, big oil and big coal. They just wanted to make sure that uh, the green agenda didn't move forward. So that's why we got a big Republican uh, uh, voter uh, situation. Um, uh, one little thing on all these um, monopolies now, and that was a problem a hundred years ago. We got all these murders and executions, mergers and uh, acquisitions, and 
it's consolidating a lot of companies into a field. And I was just yelling, you know, break up the banks earlier. We need competition. So when when things are consolidated and, 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 and you know, you only ever hear scale or economies of scale, that just means it's a monopoly or an oligopoly. And it's just something that's really bad for employment, for innovation, and, and um, competition. So I think that's another problem. Uh, okay, that's about all the uh, economic and financial stuff I want to talk about there. Thank you. Where's our speaker? Yeah, there are banks, and there's Wall Street, and there are all sorts of mechanisms by which people are exploited and oppressed. And there are, you know, whether it's in prices, taxes, or the uh, products that are sold to us. Uh, the packaging of the products. There, there are all a thousand and one ways that people are cheated from what they could have and see and uh, the way they could live. <sighs> cheated sometimes quite willingly because one doesn't know what the alternatives could be. Now, the socialist movement said that we should have labor unions, uh, free associations of workers, uh, free associations of uh, consumers, uh, of the free associations of savers and uh, investors, uh, you know, uh, yes, you know, and when it comes to, to making a society, you, you don't, just, don't just accept what you got and say, well, oh, there are a few problems. I mean, Pharaoh had a few problems, but it worked. The pyramids got built. Fortifications got built. They built an empire. It worked, but not too well for all oh, some Hebrews. Uh, a few of the resident uh, Foreigners uh, decided that they had to leave, that freedom was somewhere else for them because they were a minority who were discriminated against. And the Egyptians, who have sometimes been ruled by foreigners, <laughs> were a little envious and suspicious of that particular foreign uh, community. Well, okay. Uh, I've only got one minute left. I'm not going to create a whole different world in one minute, but uh, there were free unions, there were free consumer associations, and uh, free organizations of all sorts of in the socialist movement. You want to change the society, you've got to begin wherever you are. And I think we should be thinking about that. No, we're already over time. Speaker gets the last word. Okay. Yeah, well.
It's nine o'clock. Uh, you can't rebut a rebuttal, but it hasn't been uttered. I think I had said my case very well and very plain in my speech. I'd like to thank all the rebutters. But I do want to give some special recognition to Paul over here for helping me with the equipment tonight. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. we saw very much stepping up to the plate and taking over where I normally would. Paul, thank you again for taping. I thank you all for coming tonight. And I really wish all of you a very, very, very good night. What more could be said? Yeah, yeah thanks. Very briefly to the point. Very briefly to the point. Set my own. Yeah, I got it. All right, we got it.